this Wednesday. My name is Nicole Lerda. I'm one of two of the major gift officers here at Carlo. Um, I share that role with my colleague, Mitch Coates. I bet he's on today. Hey, Mitch. Um, and I'm delighted to have all of you join us here today. Before I introduce our guest, I want to first and foremost, our, our Carlo connections are usually 30 minutes, but Beth has uh, really put together an incredible presentation today. So we are going to go 60 minutes. Now, if in fact you can't join us for the entire time, that's fine. You just can click the leave meeting button and you can go about your day. But if you have the time, we are going to go 60 minutes so she can cover all of her material and we can get to all of your questions. Okay, I wanted to tell you that up front. Um, if you do have a question, we love questions. I'll be able to see them in the chat and I will be able to ask Beth during the presentation. So feel free to ask a question. And lastly, this is being recorded for future use at Carlo University. So with that, I want to introduce to you Beth Caldwell. Beth Caldwell has been helping women succeed in life and in business for more than 15 years. As a small business owner, entrepreneur, and mom of two, she knows firsthand the unique challenges faced by women leaders today. She is well known as the creator of the Leadership Academy for Women and fondly recognized here in Pittsburgh for her organization, Pittsburgh Professional Women, which the city of Pittsburgh just made it Pittsburgh Professional Women Day on October 16th. So congratulations, Beth, for that, uh, for that feat. Beth is, a, let's see here, Beth spent more than four years as a global instructor with the Steve Harvey Success Institute, where she taught time management, publicity, personal branding, and authentic leadership to students for more than 30 countries around the world. Beth has received the Pittsburgh Magazine 40 Under 40 Award and has recently honored with the P Pennsylvania Women of Courage Award. Her 10th book was released this year on International Women's Day. We launched her book, Women Lead. This is my autographed copy I keep right here on my desk. Uh, we launched her book this March 6th. I think it was the last event before the, the COVID shutdown, but it is called Women Lead. Today, she joins us from her home office in Highland Park, where she has been spending her days coaching, speaking, and motivating others via Zoom. So without further ado, Beth, it is my pleasure. How are you today? Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this kind of dreary Pittsburgh afternoon. I'm glad to be here with you for a little bit of lunch and motivation. Thanks for having me, Nicole. Sure. So should we dig right in? Who's ready to talk about resilience? Absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> so, for, so I do see some very familiar faces here and also some new ones. Thank you so much for joining us. Carlo University, thank you for this amazing resource. I've been on a few of these calls. Uh, the last one I learned a lot about wine, but you've had some really interesting speakers. And when we're in a pandemic, <laughs> how many pandemics have we been in, right? But when we find ourselves in a situation like this as leaders, we have to think about what can we do? There's a lot of things we can't do right now. So thank you to Nicole and your team for giving us something that we can do as leaders in the community. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about resilience, a lot about resilience actually. And I wanna give you a warning. So let's everybody take a deep breath. Hopefully you have your, your lunch with you, your hot drink, your cold drink, but get ready and buckle up because the information that I'm going to share with you today could, if you choose to implement it, <laughs> cause less stress, reduce trauma. You may have, and will very likely have some brief but awkward conversations. And when you have those awkward conversations, rapid progress may occur immediately. The tips I'm going to give you today work in life and business. So Nicole told you a little bit about me. That is Steve Harvey. Uh, the photo of me. These are my last three books. And thank you for, for mentioning Leadership Academy for Women. Sure. Um, but I talk uh, to you from personal experience of resilience, right? Right. We've all overcome challenges in our lives. And I had some pretty significant challenges in my 20s and 30s and chose to pull it, dig into my resilience and make the most of them and create a life and a business where I get to influence others. So my newest book, as Nicole mentioned, is called Women Lead, and there are 12 chapters in that book. And we pulled out, Nicole and I had a nice long talk, and we pulled out four 
uh, strategies from this book that can really help you during a crisis. So we'll say these are the essentials of leadership excellence during a pandemic, all right? And so these are four of the best essentials that I can give you for leading during these times. Today, we're going to talk about how to manage conflict and manage it quickly, how to communicate confidently, how to guide others through change, and how to be intentional in your business and in your life instead of reactive, which is a really tremendous leadership skill. So I'm not gonna waste any time because I wanna get all of this content to you in as, as little time as possible, because I find that with this presentation, especially when we talk about conflict, there are a lot of questions. And if you know me in person, I'm pretty good on my feet. And so you may have uh, some, some conflicts or some awkward situations happening at work that you wanna ask me how to handle. And I will definitely do that with you and strategize at the end. So if you don't mind, lean in a little bit, I'm gonna talk fast, okay? So the first essential we're going to talk about today is how to manage conflict quickly. And the reason I say quickly is because when a company or organization hires me to come in and fix a conflict problem, a lot of times it's been something that they have ignored or avoided. Sometimes uh, by the time they hire me, it has been going on for several years. So what is the cost of conflict? Like if this is what you see when you come into the workplace <laughs> every day, if this is, this is your team that you have to face and you're dealing with a lot of drama and complaining, you're losing three hours a week. Now, a lot of people are like, well, that's to be expected, but you're losing three hours a week per person. And that's a lot of time lost, a lot of productivity lost, and a lot of money lost. And all you have to do to shift that is to deal with the conflict and do it quickly. So how do we do that? Why do we wanna tackle it, right? We already talked about the loss of time. So we wanna, these situations that come up, one big one right now, people focused on the election. They're so focused on the election that they're not doing their work as if their work is going to change after next Tuesday anyway, because their work is most likely gonna be the same, right? So when you address that awkward situation, instead of avoiding it, you're going to enjoy improved productivity, which always impacts the profits of the company, which we really want to keep the profits up in the company so that we all can continue to work. Uh, one thing that happens when you avoid conflict at work is people will quit. People will get tired of dealing with bullies at work or people who don't do their job or people who gossip or people who are mean or people who are just prickly and difficult to be around. Those other people will leave, particularly and especially our younger generations, they won't tolerate that. And so what we see in a lot of companies that don't tackle conflicts uh, or they don't address people who are not a, a appropriately behaving at work is we have really talented and amazing people that bring a lot of energy and effort to work and they get frustrated and they leave. And it's really expensive to replace them because we've trained them and we put so much time and effort into them. And then we have new people that come on and they get frustrated with the one person who won't change and, uh, um, and people continue to leave. So when you tackle conflict, you'll be able to keep those happy employees. And if you do have a copy of my book, many people do, Nicole held it up, there is a story about a woman named Emily on page 72, not her real name, but real person, real story. Uh, read that story on page 72. Uh, there's a little section that calls, is called Let It Go. And it's an actual true story, uh, one of many in the book, where this company hired me because Emily was quitting. And she was quitting because of another employee who was not very valuable to the company. And this, these are things that we want to avoid. And that's why we have these tough, tough situations. And you know what? If you continue to ignore problems, you might wind up paying legal fees, paying fines, or find yourself in litigation. Unfortunately, Nicole, that's when most people call me, when somebody's going to take half of the company and, and start their own, or they're in litigation. And that, that is not the time to tackle conflict. That's when you have to tackle it, right? When you get served the legal papers, so much easier to do it way before that. So today, I'm going to give you a blueprint, all right? You're probably going to want to write this down. If you have to have a difficult conversation, 
This is exactly how to do it. Now, um, I teach a strategy for nego negotiation that is really similar. I don't think I have it here with me, but imagine that I have here with me a padfolio. I normally carry around a journal with me where I take notes, but I'm gonna be having a difficult conversation I have a padfolio that I use that has a legal pad inside of it that opens and closes and it's legal. I'm not doing a lot of traveling right now, so it's not at my desk, but I take that padfolio and I sit somewhere and think about the conversation and I write the notes down on that legal pad and I decide what it is that, I'm, that, that needs to be said, preparing myself ahead of time. And I put those notes in really big writing in my legal pad. And then if the conversation gets off track, we'll pretend like this is it right here. This is a file folder. We'll pretend like this is it. I can just turn that legal pad and flip it up and glance back at my notes and put myself right back on track again. Okay. So I begin my blueprints by number one, actually I'll even say before deciding on an acceptable outcome, naming the problem. The problem is so many people have trouble completing that sentence, that sentence. The problem is blank. The problem is you are spending all of your time on Twitter and your work isn't getting, getting done, right? Just say it. Number one, name the problem. Number two, we'll say, decide on what's an acceptable outcome. Now, when you sit with a person or a group of people, and you tell them what the problem is. Everybody, look, everybody knows what the problem is. <laughs> you just might be the first person who has named it, okay? And then you say what the outcome is going to be. The very first thing that's going to happen is people are going to come up with their fears and people are gonna come up with their ulterior motives, their fear that you're taking control of them or that they may lose this or they, but, 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 you don't understand, this is different, all those things that you get. You've all been in conversations like this. Prepare ahead of time so you know what to say. I understand that you feel like you need to have your freedom, but the truth is blank, right? So you want to prepare for that. And you want to reassure people. So uh, let's say, so these three things that I've done, naming the problem, deciding on the income, income outcome, and preparing for their fears, I've done all this before the meeting. Now, when I sit down at the meeting, the first thing I do is not to name the problem. The first thing that I do is begin the conversation by reassuring them. So what I'd like to tell you today is we're not firing anybody today. So you know how people will come into a meeting and they'll be like, okay, if she says this, I'm going to say this. And if I'm going to get laid off, or if they're going to give me news that the company's closing, then who am I going to tell first? And they're all in those thoughts in their head. And they're not really listening to what they're saying, what you're saying. So when you begin by saying, so nobody's going to get fired today, the company's not closing. I have some news that I want to share with you, or I have something I want to discuss with you. Now they can relax because they know they're not going to get bad news. So that is really, really important to get everybody on the same page. And then I set up a limit because I don't have three and a half hours to sit in my office and listen to somebody say, but you don't understand, <laughs> but this is different, but that's not fair, right? So I say something like, we have 20 minutes before my next appointment. And I'd like to use that time to talk about this prickly little issue that we've been facing here in the office, okay? So I let them know what time we're going to end. And this is when I state the obvious we're having a real problem with employees using social media. And what's happening is this is really cutting into our profits and our effectiveness behind on customer service. And then I'm either gonna tell what the acceptable outcome is, or I'm gonna say, can we together come up with a, with a new plan of how we're going to deal with this, right? So I'm either going to tell them what's been pre-decided or I'm gonna ask for some feedback. What do you think would fix this, okay? So stating the obvious, talking about the outcome. Do you see how fast your meetings can go? All right. Can you believe this is the end of the blueprint? Ending on time and showing some appreciation. Okay. I know this wasn't the easiest conversation you've had this week. I really appreciate you um, agreeing to make some changes. I can't see your faces right now, but I hope that you're all nodding and going, oh my gosh, can it be that easy? Uh, I do want to tell you that you might have some pushback and you might 
have some people who don't want to end on time and they want to push you past that 20 or 30 minute mark that you've made for themselves for yourself. And so what I do is, you know, wearing a watch or having my phone or a clock on the wall. If I haven't come to an agreement at the, at the time, I'm going to say, well, it's, it's 1230 right now. Our time is up. I have another meeting. Let's meet back here in the morning. How about 730? right? If I make them come in and have a meeting with me at 730, they're probably not going to waste my time tomorrow. <laughs> so that, those are two little strategies that I use to keep people on track, right? So if this is what you've been dealing with, if this is what ha has been, who wants to work in this situation, right? Whether it's on Zoom or in person, um, this conflict conversation is really helpful. And I've sent this to the team at Carlo. This is exactly what I just told you. It's a blueprint that you can print out because you're probably not gonna have a difficult conversation today, but when you do have to have one, I want you to have this, this um, blueprint that you can keep in your portfolio and you can use it to prepare yourself. Okay. So I hope that helps you. So that's essential one. Number two is being a confident communicator, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a leader at your company or an employee at your company, the person speaking is always the most important person in the room. You don't have to be at a podium. You don't have to do what I do. You don't have to be on a big stage speaking to hundreds or thousands of people to be a speaker. There are a lot of ways that you can be a speaker. So for example, you might be volunteer to train people on a new software that's in the company. That makes you the most important and knowledgeable person in the room on that topic. You might uh, volunteer to head up something small with a small team at your company. Maybe your company is doing what other companies are doing and they're saying something like, hey, we're thinking of switching from Zoom to Edge. <gasps> Change, right? <laughs> we, we, we're not sure which new software program that we're going to use. Maybe you would be the person who volunteers to research the pros and cons. And then you're speaking at a small meeting where you're talking about pros and cons. Or maybe you might volunteer to lead and speak in a way in the community, maybe for a charity or for a board, and you're doing a report or you're giving advice or something like that. It doesn't have to be on a stage. I know everybody's not comfortable with speaking, but being a confident communicator really sets you apart as a leader, okay? Now, if you... <laughs> or thinking, I don't think I can speak. I, I, I get it, Bass. It can be in a room of just three people, but that's just not where my areas are. Let me give you some superpowers for speaking, okay? Let me give you some tips on that. So number one, especially when we're talking today about these topics, you want to be, as a leader, you wanna be really aware of other people's emotions. Right? Obviously you're hopefully at a point where you're already aware of your own emotions, but when we're dealing in conflict in times like today, being really aware of your employees, your team members, their tendency to be defensive and their tendency to over-personalize issues. When you're aware of that ahead of time, it's so much easier to have a conversation because you don't get surprised and you don't get thrown off. Right. So you, you prepare for a meeting and you say something like we're going to we're going to switch from Zoom to Edge. OK, you're not and you're not prepared for people to go. I just learned Zoom. I can't. <laughs> right. Then your, your meeting is thrown off because you if you're like me, you say something like this. Uh, right. So if you're aware of the idea that when you're talking about change, people are going to be defensive. They're going to personalize things. They're going to make it all about them. They might be based in fear. If you're ready for that ahead of time, your conversations are going to go a lot smoother. Okay. For those of you who are high achievers, this is so difficult. Number two is sticking to one topic. How many of you have ever written an email or left a voice message where you called for one thing, but then you thought of something else and you added on and added on and added on? That can be really intimidating to the people that you're communicating with. We have, as women leaders, we have a great skill of being able to hold a lot of things in our heads. Not everybody else uh, can do that or not everybody else enjoys doing that. So sticking to one topic at a time. And if somebody interrupts you and tries to make it about another topic, 
today we're talking about switching websites. We're not switch. We're not talking about the printer today. <laughs> we're not talking about timesheets today, right? We're just sticking about topic. Make sure that you stick to one topic and keep everybody else on one topic. Now, here's a really important one. We're talking about confident communication. And when you, when I'm having you be perceived as a confident communicator, I want you to be aware of the tendency that everybody has, mostly women, but a lot of people do this, the tendency to minimize what they're saying or apologize for what they're saying. So here's an example of that. Thank you so much for coming in. I only am going to take five minutes of your time because I just want to go over something. There's something really little that I want to talk about with you today. These are minimizers. So you could say the same thing by, thank you so much, Nicole, for spending some time with me. I know you're busy. I'll make this as brief as possible. Do you see how you're saying the same thing, but you're saying it from a very much more confident position, right? Okay. Instead of, I'm so sorry to make you put makeup on this morning and come to the Zoom meeting. <laughs> We're going to say, thank you so much for your flexibility. I appreciate you spending time with us this morning. So pay attention to the tendency that we all have to be apologetic and to minimize what we're saying, right? If you uh, call somebody on the phone and you say, hey, it's just me, it's only me. I only need a few minutes of your time. Notice that you do that and set your intention to be different the next time that you, that you leave a message. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate your time. Today, we're going to talk about blank, right? So remember, we wanna come across as confident. And when we're talking about standing, being confident, let's talk about standing confidently and taking up your space. Likely you've already heard somebody talk about this. It's been a very popular topic for the past couple of years, but paying attention to the way you, the, the way you sit and the way you stand, whether you're the speaker or not, okay? When I am sometimes speaking at conferences and meetings, I will often see people like this. Or, <laughs> right? or, you know, these kind of things. These are uh, what, if you look at our politicians today, especially poor Kamala, right? She, people are especially hard on female politicians about the way they stand. Don't touch your hair, don't touch your face, all the things that can be perceived as weakness, right? So pay attention to if you play with your hair or if you're slouching a little bit. By the way, this, this uh, position, it's a comfortable position. I, I like to be in this position when I'm listening because I am leaning in, but it's actually scientifically the weakest position that you can be in uh, from a confidence perspective. Mm -hmm. And so they did, there's some scientific experience, uh, experiments that they did in some Ivy League colleges. I can't remember the name of it right now, but where they had people, men and women both stand in different positions and sit in different positions. You would sit in that position for three to five minutes and then they would uh, take some of your saliva and test the hormonal levels of your confidence hormones. I know I'm speaking to a college, I'm not giving the great ones, but it's a really fascinating book, uh, a fascinating study that shows how much your confidence diminishes when you minimize yourself. And even think about animals and nature, right? Thinking about, oh, um, the lion. You will never see a lion kind of meek, becoming meek or the giraffe, right? I have a giraffe right here. The giraffe's neck is always tall. But then what are those animals that are kind of creeping around, right? It's the same thing. We're not, we're not uh, respecting the animals that are crawling around and hiding. We respect the majestic animals that sit up and stand tall. So stand in your space. It's a great way to feel and, and emulate confidence. And then I added this one just for today, because I think as a leader, this is really important. And that is to recognize and honor and really respect the communication styles of the people that you both live with and work with. So, and what I mean by that is what's most commonly labeled as introverts and extroverts. And if you're somebody who's a very confident leading and speaking, it's possible that you are an introvert. Um, it's more likely that you're an extrovert. And what extroverts tend to do is surprise the introverted people on, and put them on the spot, the introverted people on their team. Mm -hmm. 
And so what they might do is you might prepare ahead of time for a meeting and announcements and you've been doing research and study and you have an agenda and you're all ready to go and people come into the meeting and don't know what you're going to talk about. You announce it and you say, and Nicole, what do you think? And if Nicole is an mm -hmm. introverted person, a cautious person, somebody who likes to research before she talks, I have just put her on the spot and made her very uncomfortable. We do this a lot uh, without awareness. And then on the other hand, if we reverse it and you have an extrovert in the team and you tell them, I'm sorry, you can't talk. Oh my gosh. They might not hear a word you say because their head's going to explode. <laughs> so make sure I'm exaggerating, of course, not offending anybody, trying to keep it light, but recognize the communication styles of the people that you work with because that will that will really ease communication and help it be a lot smoother okay i'm gonna take a little sip of my tea here because we're going to talk about awkwardness and as nicole mentioned i have i've been speaking for a long time but i've been doing a lot of webinar presentations like this one for organizations all around the united states and canada and I've been kind of surprised you guys about the comments and the questions that I get from women who are having awkward moments on Zoom from their coworkers, things that we've never thought about before. And so if something like that has happened to you or is happening to you, let's talk about that at the end. But I'm going to give you some tips um, on how to handle awkward situations. Now I wrote this book in 2019. <laughs> so these tips are about in-person uh, in person uh, uh, conversations. So I'm just going to give you some, some tips on how to handle awkward in-person situations, but they definitely relate over to virtual conversations as well. And the first one is, well, first of all, before I go into this, let me tell you, when you're in an awkward or a difficult situation, the biggest reason that it's awkward is because you don't know what to do and you don't know how to respond. And what I'm giving you here today are a couple of phrases that you can keep in your pockets so that when something awkward comes up, you'll have something to say. Because it's always, what am I going to say? How am I going to say? What should I say? What should I do? Those thoughts are what are making you uncomfortable. So if somebody gives you the phrases ahead of time and you get to practice them with them a little bit, then you'll eventually have some phrases of your own that you can use. So the first one is uh, when you have somebody who is just really talking your ear off and uh, maybe they're telling you about their foot surgery <laughs> that they had last week and they're telling you all of the details and you really wanna get out of that conversation. You may say something like, it's been so nice to meet you. I don't wanna monopolize your time. I wanna let you get to meet some other people here at the fundraiser, thank you for the information, right? Something like that. But I don't wanna monopolize your time is a very polite way to get out of a conversation that is not going anywhere. Here's something that I see a lot with uh, some of the clients that I work with are in medicine and law and education where employees tend to be very competitive with one another for promotions and positions. And sometimes, um, very much like politics. I can't help it. I have to put some politics in here because it's what's going on. But very much like in politics, their strategies might be to put other people down in order to get them promoted, get themselves promoted. And if you find yourself in the lunchroom at the coffee pot and somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you know that Joan, she has no integrity. Did you know she was late for work four times? Did you know she skipped this? Did you know? And the real agenda here is for this person to get Joan's job. You know, if you know Joan, then a good thing to say is, you know, I've always found Joan to be very professional. Excuse me, right? And that is how you can end that conversation immediately. If you don't know Joan, you can say, I don't know, I don't know either way. Um, I've never heard anything like that before. Excuse me. <laughs> Just get out of that conversation and shut them down. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in the lunchroom for 25 minutes longer than you plan to be, right? Um, how about this one? Thank you so much for letting me know. Uh, I like to use this a lot when somebody walks up to me and says, hey, your slide number 11 was marked number 12. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me know. I appreciate that. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's the best that's the best thing that I can come up with. Striving for excellence here, not perfection, but I don't need to really get into a conversation with somebody that feels necessary for, to point out every mistake that you make, right? Thank you for letting me know. That allows you to get out of the conversation. It also allows that person to feel heard, which is really what they want. They want to feel heard. Beth, if I could say one thing real quickly, um, I'm, I'm taking notes as well. And, and one of the things I've known Beth for um, probably 15 years now. And when you're listening to Beth, she, there's so much great information, but then there's this hidden nugget you will hear in one second. And I wanted you to repeat this and it was strive, we're striving for excellence, not perfection. And that is really poignant. So that's, that's my motto. <laughs> I, I adapted that a couple of years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, Nicole, when I realized that I was never going to ever please everybody. Mm -hmm. And I was trying so hard to please everybody. And as my, as my business began to grow and I began to become more visible, I got more criticism. And I struggle with that. I struggle with criticism. I struggle with people pointing out my flaws because I always try my best. So if you're like me and you always try your best and you have put out your very best PowerPoint presentation and somebody finds a flaw with it, it surprises you because you did your best. And so I used to get so very upset uh, when people would find flaws with me. And then I decided that I'm never going to be perfect. I, I admit it. I wouldn't say I decided, I admit it. We're never going to be perfect here. I love it when you put out a book that you spend you know, a year and a half of your heart and soul on. And somebody writes you and says, did you know there are two periods on page 47? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yes, I know. And that will always <laughs> happen. That will always happen. <laughs> and I, so how I, how I cope with that now, that those kind of, um, thank you for telling me. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for telling me. And then in my heart, in my own head, I say, we're striving here for excellence, not perfection. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Let's keep yes. going. Because if we're trying to get that book perfect, it's still not going to be printed, right? No. And then a really powerful, really powerful word, uh, sentence, two-word sentence that you can say that will help you stand in your space mm -hmm. and get a bully to back off of you is very plain and simple. I disagree. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs> Take your coffee and leave, right? I disagree. The person knows that you heard them, mm -hmm. and they also know that they're not going to change your mind. And you've mm -hmm. set your boundary there. You've really stood in your space. So I like this lady, right? Oh, that's an interesting perspective. You don't have to add, that's not my perspective. You can just say, that's an interesting point that I've never thought of it that way. You don't have to get into anything else. That's very interesting. Again, you're helping that person to be heard, checking that off the list, but you don't have to take that information in. Now, this is something that I used when I was in a, a community organization in, in my community where I served as a secretary. So it was, it was a local community board where we made, you know, sports, local kids sports decisions and Halloween party, Halloween day decisions like this, pools, parks, those kind of things in the community. And we would often get people from the public that would come in and they would have a problem with a pothole on a road or a problem with somebody putting, you know, their grass cuttings on the street. And it was not on our agenda, uh, but people came to these community meetings to be heard. So you might wonder, how do I come up with all of these things? These things come from personal experience. <laughs> so this, this one, this topic is obviously important to, to you, comes from a meeting that I went to many years ago where a president didn't have, the president of the board didn't have the skills or the knowledge to keep the meeting on track. And so he would let people bring up their agendas and talk about them for 25, 30 minutes and complain and complain and complain. And then we never got our work done. And we would come back two weeks later or two months later and we'd still have the same agenda items. And I thought if I were in charge, I would say, hey, Jim, this topic is obviously important to you. It's not on our agenda tonight, but you can go back to Mary and put it on the agenda for next meeting. And you can say that in a tone that is not condescending. This topic is really important to you. This is an important topic. We're not, notice I'm not minimizing it. I'm not saying, I'm really sorry we can't talk about it tonight, or unfortunately we can't talk about it tonight. 
this topic is important to you. It sounds like we should take it up at another meeting. Mary, will you put this on the agenda for next week? Boom, you're right back on track. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you guys feel about this? I want to see everybody's face. <laughs> say something in the chat so that we know that this is kind of good. I like this one. You've really given me something to think about. What can they say to that? You know, they, they're telling you their political opinion and you're not going to join them in their political opinion. You've definitely given me something to think about. You don't have to say anything else. <laughs> you can think it, but you don't have to say it. We're letting them feel heard. They can go tell somebody else now. And my fave, well, this isn't my favorite, but this is your, the, the, the last straw. The, you've, you've already said, that's an interesting perspective. This is obviously important to you. You've definitely given me something to think about. Thank you for sharing. Finally, they're not stopping. You're gonna say, you know, this is fascinating. Excuse me. Boom, the conversation is over. Do not give your time, your power, your energy, your future to somebody else that is just taking it. Um, hang on to your power and get back to your own work, okay? So that a, lot of, a lot of positive feedback coming in, Beth. Okay, good, good, good. You guys like a lot it. of positive feedback. I hate this is kind of a weird thing to say to you all, but I hope you get the opportunity to try these very soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've talked about uh, confident communication. And now we're going to talk about the third essential, which is guiding others through change, which is so important. And I found right now, this is so important. And I found this picture right now. And this is what I imagine this picture to be. Uh, a lot of my clients are thinking about leaving the Zoom platform and going over to the Microsoft Edge platform, or I think Verizon has one called Blue Jeans. And so I'm imagining that this is the woman who has made the decision. We're leaving Zoom and we're switching to Microsoft Edge. And so look at all the people in the room, right? And so she's done the research. She's figured out the pricing. She's decided what the pros or cons are gonna be. She's ready to tell them for this meeting. And this is what they say to her. We can't leave Zoom. I just learned Zoom. <laughs> I can't do this. I just figured out how to put my name down at the bottom and my background and blah, blah, blah. You see what happens? It all becomes personalized. But what if I don't know how to download Edge, <laughs> right? This is what so many of our HR professionals are dealing with. And every single one of these faces and every single time that you get pushback when you are leading people through change, imagine the governor of Pennsylvania right now like times this by a billion. <laughs> That's how many of these faces that he's had to look at. Guiding a state through a pandemic for the first time in more than a hundred years, right? All of these faces are fear. They're all fear. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can. I don't really want to. I might, things might change. Things are going to be different. What if I look silly? What if I make a mistake? That's what everybody here is thinking. And so your role is to be a confident communicator and lead them through this change and help them to feel comfortable, okay? So let me give you some tips on this. I don't want you to look like this, right? Oh my gosh, I want you to look like this <laughs> when, when they all give you that face. That's okay, I understand. I know how you feel. I know this is different, but here's how we're gonna do it, people, right? This is how you lead people through change. Remember, Mm -hmm. People always like to follow people who know where they're going. So you're the leader. You do it first. I know how you feel. I know that downloading software is really hard. I downloaded it onto my own computer. I found that this one was very easy. Okay. How about this one? I know that voting, not voting at the poll is something you've never done before, but I went to the courthouse and it was so easy really? Can I go to the courthouse? You see, you embrace the change first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So people want to follow people who know exactly where they're going. Remember to understand people are not complaining to you because they don't like you. 
I get this from leaders all the time. Nobody on my team likes me. Every time I give them an idea, all they do is criticize and complain because they're thinking about themselves and they're fearful. So when you can turn this around to they don't like me, to they're afraid of change, makes it a lot easier to have a conversation with them. So understand and empathize with their fears. I understand it's hard to put software on your computer. I know it's so annoying when you just figured out how to put a background up, but I found that this one is really easy to do, okay? And we keep everybody facing forward. That's your job. Listen to their fears, polish them up, turn them around, face them forward and push them back out again, like the mama eagle, right? You wanna keep them focused on the big picture. Do you know what's important to remember? What's important to remember is that we are all able to have a meeting and we're all able to do it safely and we need to do it securely. Otherwise, we can't be in business. See, that takes it all off of, oh, this is so uncomfortable for me. This is so awkward for me. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's not really about me. So keep everybody facing forward, focused on the big picture. All right. And this is the hardest one. If you need to, you have to take action immediately. And if you want a good story, go into my book on page 40 and read about Frank. It's about a four page story. It's a true story. It was one of the most difficult conflicts that I navigated ever for a company. And I have to tell you something. It was, I know you know the story, Nicole, you told me you read it. It was so much easier of a conversation than anybody ever imagined. And I wanna tell you, I got paid a lot of money to have that conversation. And I prepared for a long time to have that conversation. And it lasted about four minutes. It wasn't as hard as everybody was making it. Okay, so taking immediate action when necessary. And here's an example of what I mean by that. Let's imagine that um, you have switched your company from the Zoom platform to the Edge platform. And you have a Frank in your company who says, I don't do Microsoft products. I'm not coming. And Frank doesn't show up for the first four meetings. You shouldn't wait until the fourth meeting. You call Frank on the phone and say, Frank, you weren't on this morning's meeting. And he says, I don't do ads. Then you say, Frank, it's, you know, you have a choice. Are you just going to not show up for work? Did you want to apply for another position? Are you resigning? You got to take immediate action or Frank is going to take advantage of you and other people are going to wind up doing his work. Okay. Deep breath now. Remember, when you are brave and courageous enough to take on a conflict or when you're the person who speaks up in a difficult conversation, you are showing everybody around you how to do it and you're giving them permission to do the same. All right. So our fourth essential is being intentional, leading with intention. And how do you like my goldfish here, <laughs> right? This little goldfish is the same as all the rest of the goldfish, but he has strapped on a shark, uh, <laughs> right? So he's like, come on, everybody, we're gonna get through this, we're gonna get to the other side. Uh, that's the difference and that's leading with intention. And this is a full, really all of these are full one hour um, presentation or longer. But what I wanna tell you about being intentional is thinking about, who you want to be and who you want your organization to be or who your organization is supposed to be and are we doing it? What I see, you know, I'm very blessed with my career and I get to travel a lot. And what I see a lot with American women and in the American culture is I see people who are doing a lot. And being intentional is exactly that. It's, it's not what you're doing, it's who you're being. And so sometimes we get people or we become people who have achieved a certain thing or created a certain thing. And they think this is not at all what I wanted. How did this happen? And so it's about who you are. Here in America, we talk about a lot about what people do. Oh, you're an architect, that's so impressive. You're a surgeon, you're an oncologist, that's so impressive. My goodness, you're an attorney. You're the we talk about what people do. And what we want to do is we begin one person at a time and we focus on who people are being. Oh my goodness, you're so empathetic. You're so courageous. You're so intuitive. You're so creative, right? We talk about who they are being and not what they are doing. And that really is a shift in energy, okay? 
so it's a little bit of a different topic on the conflict, but if you are here in your office and all you're doing is meeting after meeting after meeting, I remember when I was a social worker, I felt like my whole job, I came to the job as a social worker because I wanted to change people's lives. And I felt like all I did was sit in a cubicle and take a piece of paper here and move it over here. And that was all that I did all day. And that is not who I wanted to be. So if you are leading a group of people, I don't want you to be leading them from one drama and conflict to the next. I want you to be leading them from one achievement to the next. So pay attention to that. Sometimes we get off track. It just takes a little bit of time and, and thinking to get back on track. And so I'm gonna see how much time we have because I have my phone shut off. And do we want to maybe talk about tips to stay resilient like during the the, to, uh, the questions? What do you think, Nicole? It's 1245. Okay, so we're okay, so we have time. Everything that has come into the chat is is just appreciation for all of this excellent information. People are asking, can they get a hold of these slides? And yes, we are going to send out the slides along with uh, best blueprint um, in the recording. Uh, so you'll have all of this at your fingertips. So everybody's everybody's loving it. I'm glad that you get it. Well, let me give you some tips to stay resilient. I'm just going to give you in in the book Women Lead. Uh, there are uh, 12 or 18 tips on being resilient inside of chapter two, but I think that during times such as these, my best advice for being resilient is to focus on what you've accomplished. What I see a lot of leaders doing is telling me, you know, I say, how things are, how are things going? And they begin to tell me a, a list of everything that they haven't had a chance to get to. And what I like to do is turn that around. I used to do this myself and turn this around. And at the end of the day, look at all of the things that you have accomplished. You'll be a lot more tired and you'll sleep better <laughs> if you focus on all the things that you've done, because I see how busy you are every day. And I see you octopus leaders, right, who are taking care of mother or grandmother over here, and you're taking care of children over here, and you're taking care of your work right here, and you're taking care of the neighbor over here, and you're doing all of this, and you're like, oh, I did not make any investments into my retirement account this month. <laughs> you're focusing on what you're not doing instead of what you are doing. So that's my best tip for you um, to stay resilient. And another thing I think right now, two more things I'll give you. Um, always focus on what you can do. I can't, I can't go to my families for Thanksgiving. I can't go to my aunts for Thanksgiving where we have 40 people. Um, let's talk about what you can do. I can cook mashed potatoes for the first time in 40 years, <laughs> whatever is the truth. Let's talk about what you can do. And then, um, and even with your business, look at our restaurants, okay? We have some restaurants that said, I can't, I can't do this. I'm not allowed to be able to work this way. So we're going out of business. We've had other restaurants that have said, how can we make this work? What can we do to keep our employees working and to keep things going? And we've had some pretty um, ingenious and innovative things come up from restaurants. I've seen some amazing uh, ideas that people have created, like baskets of food that you can pick up and take home. Sorgles up in Wexford created uh, um, pre-packaged groceries for a whole week that you could just drive up and get and they would just pick them. People became, as they do in a crisis, very innovative. So focus on what you can do. And the last tip I have for you on resilience is really, there is always somebody who needs help always. And chances are you do not have to look very far to find somebody that could use some help right now. And helping others get through a tough time is the best food for your soul. So do a little bit of that this holiday season. Now I've been lucky, as I said, to travel around the United States and Canada, and I've gotten to meet a lot of people in a lot of different neighborhoods, rural, urban, suburban, big, big companies, little teeny nonprofits. And I have seen some consistency. And everywhere I go, I see this. Number one, every person that is working at your company, every single person has potential. That's the absolute truth, okay? Everybody is doing the best they can. 
Some people can handle crises and stress a little bit better than others, okay? Everybody is doing the best they can. I had told Nicole back in March, most people do not come to work with the intention of ruining everybody's day. Most people don't do that. Most people are doing the best they can. And every person that you know in your life and your personal life and your family and your community and at work, every person that you work with, they are either going to leave, live up or down to the expectations that are set for them. And that includes yourself. The expectations that you set for yourself of excellence instead of perfection, of resilience, of being instead of doing. You will live up or down to whatever expectation that you set for yourself. So remember that, and we will send these slides out. Um, <clears throat> if we want to go deeper on any of these topics, this book, inside of this book, uh, it talks all the way through it. You can go to coachbethcaldwell.com and click on Women Lead, and a, a lot of these resources will be there. And Nicole's going to send you a great um, email with a lot of the resources in them. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that I can see everybody's face. And Nicole, we'll take questions. We still have 10 minutes. We'll take questions however you want to give them to me if people want to ask them or if you want to read them. We do have um, we do have a few minutes. I don't have any questions, Beth. I think you covered so much. I think people are as in every Beth Caldwell web <laughs> workshop, just um, you know, overwhelmed with this good information. Um, again, all positive feedback, a lot of thank yous. Um, and um, we, are, we are so grateful that you shared this information with us today. Again, I, um, we will be sending out the recording, we will send out the slides and we will send out the blueprint. Beth today is also gifting uh, her latest book to the first three people who wrote into the chat. And that was uh, Sandra Lewis, Janie and Aaron McManus. We will track you down and we will get you a copy of this book. Um, I, I do, um, you know, Beth, I, I loved what I heard today. I've known you for so long. You know, when I was a leader, I was taught to set expectations. Um, it's the most important thing I do in professionally and personally. You're telling us to use our words strategically, but what I love most is you're weaving compassion in, in a very tough thing to do. So I, I think it's it's wonderful. And lastly, uh, Beth did not tell me to say this, but I'm going to. Um, I've personally been a member of, of her organization, Pittsburgh Professional Women. Uh, she is the ex executive director now since I was, gosh, when I got into the workforce in my early 20s. So it's been a, it's been a long time, but, um, she offers this kind of content regularly. Beth is one of my, if not my best mentor, and I've learned so much from her. So you can continue to get this kind of content if you become a member of her organization. Um, Beth, is that is that PittsburghProfessionalWomen.com? Absolutely, it is. Yeah. Okay. So um, I do I do have a question here. Um, when you say to someone, I disagree, should you add the word respectfully before the word disagree? I would say it depends on the conversation. Are you, or, let's see, who's asking that question? I saw that come through. Um, Stephanie. So Stephanie, it depends on the situation. So if somebody is not respecting you or they're not respecting someone else, you can simply say, I disagree. Uh, if you respectfully disagree, so let's say, for example, it's your boss, and, and I'm going to go back to the very simple, uh, we'll make it even more simpler. I think that Macs are better than PCs, and it's your boss. You can say, I respectfully disagree. I really found my Mac to be so amazing, right? But it, so it depends on the, on the topic. Sometimes respectfully could be a minimizer. So if this is a very harsh and hostile and bully type of person, and you say, I respectfully disagree, you're actually being submissive to that person, mm -hmm. where you could say, I disagree. Boom. They really don't know what to say to that mm -hmm. because bullies are not used to getting that comment back to them, right? By the way, I learned that from my mother, not that topic I disagree, but I learned from my mother because she was seeing me all the time struggling with people saying things to me. <laughs> that I wasn't expecting because people would come up to me and say things that I would never say to people. Mm -hmm. 
you should do that. You know what you should really do? You should really do that. You should really start this. You should really, you really shouldn't drive a, a foreign car. Like I, just things that I would never say to people. Mm -hmm. And my mom said to me, you, you really need to just have some things in your back pocket that you can say when people say that to you. And then you can just go about your day because what was happening is I'd be going on my career. By the working with Steve Harvey was, by the way, if you ever need these zingers, believe me, Steve Harvey can come. That's his gift, right? Okay. So he helped me. He helped me with a lot of them as well. But when when I was moving up my career, so I would do something and somebody would say, you should really do that. And it would take me off course. So I started to only take advice from people that I would trade places with. If they didn't have the career that I wanted, here's one I love. Nicole, I bet you got this a few times in your life. You should really get married. Yeah. You should really get married. You should really have another child. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they didn't have the, the, the love life, the marriage, the relationship that I wanted, then I learned to not take their advice. And having the, 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 the professional, polished one-line replies, not mm -hmm. rude, not condescending, but just polished and professional replies, that what was happening is I would get thrown off track or I would get distracted or I would worry about it for two days. This email that somebody sent me that I didn't even know, but I would get myself get off track. And when I started having these responses, I disagree. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> right. Then I could just get back against my day. I saw another one came through. There's one last question I'm going to give you and it, it lends itself to what you just said. And I, I, I think they do. Do these strategies work going up the ladder, for instance, a conflict with your boss? So I would want to know a little bit more about the conflict of, with your boss. If you want to type a little bit of that in, I can go with it. But yes, these strategies are actually intended to take you up the ladder, right? I can't tell you how many board meetings I've been in where I've been hired to come in and fix a conflict. And so what it is, is you come around a meeting, you come around eight or 10 or 12 people in a boardroom and you have one person that takes the meeting off track and nobody says anything because the person at the head of the table is supposed to, but they don't because they don't know how to say it. They don't know what to say because they would never do that. I would never railroad a meeting into my personal agenda. So I don't really know how to respond to that. So if you are the person who speaks up and says, I don't think that's our topic for today. You don't say, I'm really sorry, mm -hmm. or excuse me, or I hate to interrupt you here, but this is really not our topic for today. What you say is actually, that's not the topic for today. That's something we can put onto a future meeting, or that's not even a topic that we should be discussing here at work. Here's what happens, because I've done this dozens of times. Everybody around the room goes like this. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> because they just wish that they had the courage to do it yeah. and when you do those kind of things guess what you get the promotions people look bosses leaders today they do not want employees that just do a list of things to do here's your list of things to do go and do it they want employees that come back and say you know i think that this would work better mm -hmm. It might be a good idea if we tried this or that, or, you know, I know that you really don't like the insecurity of Zoom. Have you ever thought about Microsoft Edge? It sounds like I'm pitching here for Microsoft Edge. I'm not really, but this is a conflict that I keep hearing coming up and it's one we can all relate to, but your, your boss is going up the ladder. They want somebody who's going to push back to them a little bit. They want somebody to say, I disagree. I don't think that that would benefit our clients at all. In fact, I think we may lose business from that. Really? Why do you think that? I think that works really well going up. Wonderful. Well, we are going to close today. Um, Beth, thank you. Thank you for this hour of, of brilliance. Um, we love having you and, and hopefully we'll schedule you again. Um, I know you have a myriad of topics that you speak on. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We love having you. This is a wonderful way for us to, to connect with you while we can't go out and really visit you. Uh, same time next week, November 4th, uh, Wednesday at noon, we will be hosting Aaron Phillips, who is the Associate Professor and Program Director of Carlos New occupational therapy program. So she'll be talking about that. She'll also talk about how our mercy values were the foundation in which that program was built. So um, 
we're going to be signing off now. So stay, stay warm and stay healthy. And uh, we miss all of you. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye, Nicole. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye, Beth. Thank you.